Good evening. There we go. A little brighter. And I forgot my light. <clears throat> but we'll be all right. I did it Sunday night without my light either. So I just got to remember to get that light. We have some lights set up in the auditorium that helps get the shadow out of my eyes. And so uh, <clears throat> I'll try to get those in here uh, next Sunday night. But I hope you had a good week. I uh, hope that uh, you're doing well. And I'm looking forward to the passage we have tonight. Looking forward to being together. We'll give it a few more minutes. <clears throat> we don't want to start too early. Uh, if you do have um, prayer requests that you want me to share, please text those in to me. And uh, we'll make sure that we mention those as we begin this evening. Also, um, what a rainstorm, huh? We had some rain. I heard that Craigsville uh, had about an inch and a half of, of uh Hail. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's given biblical folks. I was told that the cicadas this year is supposed to be a bad year. I guess it's like that six or seven year um, hatch that's supposed to happen. And uh, of course, you go a couple weeks ago, we had the earthquake in Idaho. We've got this uh, pandemic pestilence. We're getting ready to get cicadas, which are locust. And, uh, and we're having, um, we're having uh, hail storms in Craig's Vice getting biblical. It's getting real biblical, so it's exciting. <clears throat> you know, this is, I was talking to uh, Brother Dwight Smith, and you know this is a great time to be a Christian. It's a great time to serve the Lord. And we have to face each and every day with the optimism that God has placed us here for such a time as this. And um, that no matter what is happening in our world, our anchor, right, our Our, our purpose, our vision uh, is celestial. We know where we're going. We know who's in control. And um, and we know uh, what to, who holds tomorrow. And this is a tremendous, um, they're aware, uh, like maybe never before in my lifetime, of the reality of the of death and the uh, the fragileness of life, and so what a tremendous time to be able to preach the gospel! Tremendous time to be able to be a Christian and serve Him, and so uh, I encourage you just to you know uh, stand fast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, our labor is not in vain, and we do not have to be overcome by fear. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. That's a first sneezing on an online broadcast. All right. Still giving it a few more minutes. I'll tell you what, Saturday's the opening of turkey season here in the mountains. <clears throat> so I'm going to do some social distancing uh, in the woods. Uh, me and Jude and Jeremiah did a little social distancing. Last Saturday was youth day. And we got out and I had them on uh, three birds. We heard them in the trees early in the morning, snuck in about 70 yards from them. And uh, the boys missed. They came in on us and uh, the boys, uh, their trigger fingers got a little itchy and they fired before they should have. So uh, we educated three turkeys, one long beard and two jakes. Uh, last Saturday, they're, uh, they're smarter. You could tell those jakes probably had never been fired at. One flew up in a tree right in front of us and it happened. It was so funny. So, oh, but good times, good, great memories. So, <clears throat> all right. Let's see here. Getting a few texts on uh, things to pray about. So that's good. If you do have prayer requests, I hope uh, they're doing well. It seems like the numbers in the U.S. are gaining, uh, are growing. Uh, but there is some, there's some hope. Uh, looks like this, um, I think the way you say it is uh, chloroquine, or at least hydro, um, hydroxychloroquine, seems to be a drug that uh, is, is greatly debated but there's some evidence out there that it's really doing a good job. So uh, I think that we'll see hopefully um, a progression in this in the positive, you could say, you know, bending the curve as they um, as they try to treat people with it. I saw in an article that the uh, governor of Florida ordered a million um, pills, I guess you'd say, uh, of of the uh, that malaria drug. So they're going to try it there. I think New York City now has opened it up. One report I saw uh, is allowing that in for a long time. The governor of New York was not allowing that. 
and now he is. So we'll see what happens. Um, it is also interesting if you look and see uh, countries that use that, that. That drug has been used, or at least chloroquine has been used since 1944, I believe, and um, uh, to as a uh, as a medication for malaria, uh, both to prevent malaria as, all, as well as to treat it. And countries who you have used that drug for years have a much lower um, COVID-19 infection. Uh, one of the things I was reading uh, was uh, a study that was done in, in the definitiveness uh, or the, um, the reality of that uh, was pretty um, obvious. Now, you know, you know, what, what do you believe? There's just so many voices out there right now. Uh, so many opinions, so many uh, doctors that are divided on exactly which direction to go. So, you know, we should pray that God, uh, if it's his will, that he allows us to progress in this and be able to take it away. Um, I just, you know, I just encourage you, don't, don't um, be a fatalist, right? Uh, don't jump on the doom and gloom bandwagon. Um, don't think the worst. Uh, you know, we can, uh, we should always try to look for the glass half, uh, half full instead of half empty. All right, it's 702. And so we'll get started this evening. We are in First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. I'm only dealing with three verses tonight. So uh, Lord will that I won't preach for a whole hour. I did a little better uh, Sunday night and uh, we're gonna try to do a little better this evening as well. But I'm glad you're with us this evening. I hope your week has been uh, good. I hope it's, uh, uh, you've uh, been blessed this week. Um, uh, one thing that we got to cover now that we're into the seven o'clock hour <clears throat> is, uh, this Sunday service, you know, if, if there's one thing that is constant, it's the inability of the meteorologist to nail the weather. And so, uh, when I looked at our weather a week out as of Sunday, uh, last Sunday, this coming Sunday was supposed to be just gorgeous and beautiful. Now we see that the forecast has changed and they're calling for 90% rain. In fact, you're supposed to have a quarter inch of rain even just in the morning hours. And so it's going to be a deluge was uh, really predicated on the fact that we had good weather and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So I'm about 98% sure that we will not have a drive-in service on Sunday. There's no reason to do it. If you drive up and it's pouring rain, you can't open your windows. And if you can't open your windows, you can't hear the message. Um, the technology to be able to broadcast on an FM uh, station and be able to broadcast it into your car where you could hear it through your car uh, windows, uh, those uh, receivers that you have to buy for that, I think are pretty expensive. Uh, one quote that I saw was $1,500, and that was for one that broadcasted uh, your message about 100 feet. And anything over that, uh, the transmitter you would need would cost around $5,000. And so, uh, I mean, financially, that's just not reasonable, at least not for us at this time. So uh, at this point, about 98%, uh, we're going to just do our online service in the auditorium like we were doing and have been doing. And you can just tune in on Sunday morning and have church right there in your home. And uh, I'd encourage you to do that. And again, I've been very pleased with the uh, with those that have watched our services. I had uh, people contact me, tell me they were watching and sharing them. And I would encourage you to do that and also subscribe. It helps us if we can get a hundred subscribers. Uh, we can get a, de a dedicated URL for our YouTube channel. It does help. And so um, I encourage you to subscribe. I encourage you, uh, every single device you have, if you subscribe, or every different account. So if you have kids that have devices, that'll help as well. And I encourage you to do that. Also share, share our services. Uh, share them online, both in your uh, Facebook. Uh, share them uh, with uh, email and uh, try to get uh, the, you know these services out to the public, especially our local public. Uh, boy, I tell you, I just hope that God can use these as an opportunity to reach our community. And, uh, and so uh, we encourage you to do that. People we need to pray for. We need to pray for Tom Greenwood. We've mentioned him before. He was kind of like pac uh, patient zero or one here in the uh, in the Clifton Forge area, and he's still struggling. Uh, I had somebody text me a follow-up or an update on his condition, and they're praying for a miracle. So, you know, I just encourage you to pray for him and that family. And then also, uh, Mitch had us pray for Miles. He's getting close to getting married, and there's, uh, and, you know, this is there's no doubt that this pandemic is a complication to his marriage um, as far as the event. 
And, uh, and so, uh, you know, just pray, uh, you know, we're obviously hoping for the best. I'm going to sneeze again. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I don't know why I'm sneezing all of a sudden. I don't have it. I feel great. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, pray for Miles. He's not feeling well. And we don't know exactly uh, all that uh, there is. Hopefully he doesn't have it. Uh, but um, he may have to get tested. We'll see. So pray for Miles. All that's going on there. All right. Well, let's start this evening with a word of prayer. And then we'll jump into the text. First Kings chapter 19. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word this evening. We thank you for uh, your love for us. We thank you that you're in control. We're thanking that you can use even a pandemic to draw men's hearts uh, closer to you. Uh, Lord, bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that during this time, uh, though life is different and the the, the norm is a greater light and greater salt for this world, that we would be the uh, the preachers of the gospel. Uh, that you desire us to be. Father, I pray for these that have been mentioned. We pray for Miles with all the details of his wedding coming up in May. I pray that you would just bless there. Father, I pray that you would uh, help him feel better. Lord, uh, strengthen his body. Allow it to fight whatever that he is uh, he's caught and he's not feeling well. I pray you be with Tom Greenwood here in our area as he's fighting this um, coronavirus. Father, I pray that you would strengthen his body, that you do a miracle there. <clears throat> And follow that, uh, you would just raise him up. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to show us this evening in your in your word. We pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, First Kings chapter number 19. If you remember where we left Elijah off, uh, he had called down the, uh, the fire from God. Then he had jumped ahead of God, and uh, he had moved when God had never told him to. And uh, he headed out to take on Jezebel, which was not God's will for his life. And in the midst of that, he ran. Uh, consumed with with uh, self loathing, really uh, decided that his life was not more valuable than anybody else, and, and asked God to take his life. And God reminded him uh, of who he was. He took care of his physical need, both uh, sleep and food. And then he uh, and then he took him all the way to the Mount of God. Forty days of fasting there, uh, took him to the Mount of God there, Mount Horeb, and he just he demonstrated himself to him. Uh, he was in. He had an earthquake, fire, uh, and it was in a great wind. But it was the still small voice of God, and the still small voice of God came and began to give Elijah instruction on how to get back to where he needed to be. Go back to following what I tell you is what he was saying. And we come down really to the end of a uh, of verse number. Um, well, we can start in verse sixteen. He says, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Ebel Maholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have 19, 20, and 21 is what we're looking at uh, this evening. And so God has given him this instruction. Uh, Elisha was really kind of the last instruction that he gave him. And, and yet Elisha is the first uh, objective that Elijah accomplishes. And so we come to verse 19. It says, so he departed. And he with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I, did, what, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Now, this is a very fascinating passage. It's a fascinating passage because it's one of the passages of the Word of God where we see a man called into what we use in the terminology of today, full-time Christian service. Now, the problem with that, I think words are important. And I believe that it's not just semantics. It's not just, well, you say it one way and I say it in another way. But I believe that our words shape our reasoning. If we're not careful we will become accustomed to just a way of saying something 
And we won't probe deeper and think, well, how, what is this, how is this affecting our culture? We've used these words, full-time Christian service. The problem with that is every Christian is called to be a full-time Christian. Every Christian. The moment you get saved, the moment that you're born again, you accept Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection. When you accept that as your payment, as your um, pardon for your sin, and the Holy Spirit comes to reside within you. You are birthed into the family of God. You're adopted as a child of God. You become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And you are a full-time, uh, you're a full-time Christian. And there's never a day off for a Christian. There is not, there isn't secular ground and sacred ground for the Christian. All ground is sacred ground for the Christian. Everything we do each and every day should be for the glory of God. And we should live according to his purpose. It's not, uh, I think every Christian is to be full-time. I think every Christian is called to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Even Paul, in his uh, salutations of his epistles, he would begin the epistle by saying that he was the servant of Jesus Christ. He would end the epistles many times by saying he was a servant of Jesus Christ. And there's an understood that we're all called to serve, and we're all called to serve Jesus Christ. Every Christian is called to ministry in one degree or another. We're all called to preach the gospel. There is not a specific calling that is just for preaching the gospel. Every Christian is to obey the Great Commission. We used to say it this way. We say, well, you either go or send the substitute. No. If you look at the wording of the Great Commission, each of us are to go and send a substitute, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. And so uh, we're all called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all called to edify the brethren. This is part of being a Christian is the ministry of edification, the ministry of building each other up, bearing each other's burdens, sharpening iron, iron sharpeneth iron. This is the job, holding each other accountable. This is a responsibility of every Christian. How about to serve in the local church? Absolutely. Every Christian is to serve in their local church. Now realize this. There is a, there is a debate out there between the universal body okay, and the local church. Now some people call it the universal church. I don't like that terminology. I, I, when you think about universal church, you think of the Catholic church, uh, which we know is an apostate um, religion. It is, uh, it is not the truth. Um, not only that, but when you think about this universalism idea, we, when he was off doing some activity and he was on the phone, and the pastor said, man, we missed you today at church. And he said, well, it's okay, sir, pastor. I, I, uh, I, I, I wasn't able to come, but I did see the online service. Hey, listen. Uh, the problem with that is this. This is great technology we're, we're experiencing right here. I, I'm so thankful that I live in an era that even in a lockdown, we can communicate this way. You can text me. I can text you. We can talk on the phone. And then I can sit in front of a computer and I can preach the word of God. And while you're socially distancing in your home, you can listen to this. But all of this technology is no substitute for what God's commanded us to do. It's not a substitute. And that means this, that come Sunday morning, when this lifts, realize this, we may continue to do this type of broadcasting because I think it's a great tool, but realize that if you stay home, when you should be at church with the body, you're in disobedience. God expects us to come together because there's something tangible and needed, necessary uh, for the fellowship of the brethren. And this is a very limited fellowship we're having right here. We like it in our society, but you realize even with all the connectivity we have digitally, we still are failing in interpersonal relationships. We have a deter uh, it's not what uh, God wanted. Uh oh, it tells me that we are, your connection is re, hopefully that just came back on. These are new things. Here I am. I'm dissing this uh, this type of uh, of broadcast, and I'm getting warning signals. YouTube doesn't like it. All right, but this is inferior. This is not what God has determined. It's not what God has um, designed. The, the local body is important, and as Christians, we are to serve in our local church. It's the purpose of the church. It's a place of service. It's uh, sure it's a place that we come and we're fed the word of God. It's a place that uh, we connect with other Christians. It's a body. It's a building. Uh, there's a, it's the bride, uh, but it's also a place of service. And so when we think about when we think about what we're getting ready to look at here in these verses, I like to say this: We're going to see a man called to occupational ministry, and the calling to occupational ministry is real. It's real. I think a better way to say it would be this. The calling of occupational ministry is a gifting 
by the Holy Spirit. It's not just a calling. It's a gifting, and the Bible is explicit on uh, the the specificity of this gifting. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, I'll read them to you. Jot them down. You can look at them later. It says, and he gave some, he's talking about the local church. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, when you look at these gifts that God has given, we realize that there's no longer apostles because one of the qualifications of being an apostle of Jesus Christ, you had to be uh, taught by him personally, and you had to have physically seen the resurrected Savior, all right? Uh, and uh, that's not, that, that it's impossible to, to happen today. So we have no apostles. It doesn't matter who uh, puts that up in front of their name, apostle so-and-so, they're wrong, they're unbiblical. Uh, prophets in the same aspect, there's no need for prophecy because we have the completed canon. The revelation of God is, is um, applied to our hearts and lives. It's where the Holy Spirit uh, takes that which is already alive and bears light to the truth of the Word of God. That's illumination. Not revelation. Some will say, well, I had a revelation from God. No, you didn't. Revelation ceased. Uh, John said, if you add to this book, the curse of this book will be applied upon you. If you take away from this book, again, uh, there is a, there's a penalty for that. And, and so uh, revelation ceased with the book of Revelation. And there's no need for that. We have the heart of God, and we have everything we need for godliness and righteousness in this present world. And so so uh, someone says, well, you have your inter interpretation, and I have mine. No, there's only one per interpretation. No scripture is given of any private interpretation, right? Uh, you don't have you don't get to have your own interpretation. It has one meaning. What did it mean when it was said to whom it was said? But one verse can have multiple applications. In fact, God can take a verse and apply it to you personally in a different way than He applies it to me. And so application is is varied. Application is is numerous. Application is wide open. And but these terms we use are very important. And so I don't like using the term full time Christian servant. I think every Christian is a full time Christian servant, though every Christian is not called to occupational ministry, nor are they gifted for occupational ministry. So we see there's no need for prophets in our in the dispensation in which we're in. Um, but we have evangelists and we have pastor teachers. Now, when you look at this, there's some men that try to say, well, there's a gift for pastoring and there's a gift for teaching. And the only reason that they believe that is because they're ignorant of the Greek uh, grammatical construction of this verse. Uh, when you look at this verse in the Greek language, you realize that there is an inseparable connection between pastor teacher. He's using, uh, he's using these two terms to describe the one person. Right. And so it, it's uh, here we see these are giftings. And it's very fascinating when Paul was talking to his son in the faith, Timothy, who was a young pastor. He even referenced this gifting in First Timothy chapter four here. And let me say that you see an emphasis in the word of God for these three things, uh, for the gifting office and calling of pastoring. What does he say? Give a tendencies, First Timothy, Second Timothy and Titus. Those are. Uh, the marching orders for a pastor. Those three books, we call them the pastoral, to preach the book, to exhort people, uh, to admonish people. Here, he's to give attendance to reading. What is he talking about? The reading the word of God. And he's talking about here, not only reading it, but he says um, to exhortation to doctrine. All right, then in verse 14, he says, neglect not the gift that is in thee. That's fascinating, right? So he's here's Paul, an apostle talking to Timothy, a pastor. He says, neglect not the gift that was given thee, or excuse me, the, neglect not the gift that, that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, right? With the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, the word prophecy many times can be used interchangeably for preaching, but you realize he was called, all right? He was gifted for the work of pastoring, and that gift was conveyed, get it? with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. All right, now what is the presbytery? There's three different words in the Greek language that describes the office of pastor. Uh, you have bishop, presbyteros, or excuse me, episkopos. You have presbytery, which is presbyteros. And then you have uh, poimen, 
five, he said, uh, for this cause, let thy the increase to put in order the, uh, the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. And so there's an ordination that is supposed to take place when it comes to the role, the gifting and the office of being a pastor, which is one of the gifts that God gave to the church. And in that gifting, when those men lay their hands on someone, I believe personally, that there is a spiritual gift imparted. I remember when I was in college, a guy walked up to me and he said, well, I'm an evangelist. We were both. I said, am I a pastor? He said, well, no. I said, why am I not a pastor? He said, because you don't have a church. And I said, exactly. And I said, and you're not an evangelist because God hasn't given you an itinerant ministry yet. So there's, it's interesting when you think about, when you think about um, the reality of that. And that's this, that just because a guy stands up and preaches doesn't mean that they have that gifting to be a pastor or be an evangelist. Not everyone. Some people can just be good communicators, but there's something beyond just good communication that makes someone eligible to, to function in the role that God has created, and that is a spiritual gifting. And he gave some, and he gave these gifts to the church. And so we see that. Now, folks, I've gotten a text message here that says that my connection is weak. I'm just going to try real fast to make sure that my connections are actually looking good here. Um, I had that um, that one thing pop up. Yeah, it says I'm connected wirelessly as well as I'm, I'm connected with a cable. We worked that out earlier I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off, and that way it forces it to use the cable. I do know that there have been people in the area that have had power lines go down with the storm last night. Uh, I know people have been without power. Hopefully, our uh, internet connection is not suffering because of that. So hopefully, hopefully this will continue and we'll be okay. So when we look at this, we, we realize there's a number of things here. God, God is still calling men into occupational ministry. He's still doing it. It's very fascinating to me that it seems like Christians are, are um, they realize the importance of, of ministry. They, they even recognize the, um, the sin that's around us. And, they, and there's an urgency about Christians, but yet urgency is at an all-time high, but enlistment is at an all-time low. Christ told us in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he says, Therefore say, said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. So when you realize this, God wants, God wants us to pray that he sends forth laborers. The problem is not the calling of God, but the hearing of men. That's the problem. The problem is not the calling of God. It's the hearing of men. Isaiah, after he had dealt with his sin, after he had had a vision of the Savior, it was then that he said, I heard, also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said, I hear my send me. So when we begin to look at this passage before us in verse 19, 20, and 21, we see a man who is called in the occupational ministry. Now, this is Old Testament. He's going to be a prophet. But though it's a different dispensation, I still feel like we can glean some tremendous truths from this illustration, even for today's gifting and calling into occupational ministry. The first thing we see is Elisha's call to service. Elisha's call to service. It says there in verse 90, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. First we see this. Elijah was a man, Elisha was a man of means. Elisha was a man of means. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. That's impressive. That would be impressive today. Right. This guy, this guy, if you think about the plowing and you were if you were to put that in today's vernacular, the man was plowing a, a field. And he was using 12 different tractors. All right. I mean, that's the significance of this. 12 oxen, 24 oxen with all the implementation. All right. To be able to plow. And he is the 12th yoke. All right. So there's 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 11 yokes ahead of him, probably 11 different servants, and they're all probably going uh, staggered through this field. And that's significant. Uh, he, he owned at least one set of those oxen that we know of, we can say they were his, uh, because he, and, the, and plowing with, and the tools that he was plowing with. But 
everyone I read and everything, I keep getting text about our uh, our service. Hopefully it's still transmitting. All right. Um, this is the first time we've had a lag in our um, in our network. I did see some guys working on our equipment out here in the back. We have, a, um, I don't know what you would call it, like a, um, a junction box that services our area. Hopefully uh, nothing was uh, was messed with there, but we'll get back to it. So when we think about at least one of the sets of oxen was him. It was his. But we believe as we look at it, and I believe personally that all 12 are his. Uh, he cared for people who were probably his servants. He cared for people who were probably his servants. Um, we see that he fed them. These people that are in the text were probably in employment of his, all right? Which again would speak to his wealth. Uh, we would think about he cared. Um, we think about this wealth, his wealth in that period of time is significant. Think about it this way. If all 24 oxen were his and all of these people were under his employment, they were his servants, they had just gone through three and a half years of drought and he was able to sustain his oxen. They didn't die. He was able to sustain these people. And so when you think of that, Elisha must have come from a very affluent family. When I think of that, I realize this. The wealth has never been justifiable. Wealth has never been a justifiable spiritual reason for any occupation. God has called the poor to be kings, such as David, a shepherd boy. He's called the rich to be poor in his service. And Christ left the splendors of heaven to come to earth. Some have the idea that, well, if if I'm too smart, if I'm too talented, or if I'm too affluent, then ministry is not an option for me. But that's not true according to this illustration. Not only was he a man of means, he was a man of motion. Now, I love this part. He could have had others doing the work, but he was engaged in the work personally. Think about that. If these oxen were his, and these that were employed in this work of plowing were his servants, there's no doubt Elisha as a owner or Elisha as a family member of uh, the plantation or the, or the farm could have had another servant plowing, but that's not what he does. He's out there right in the middle of it. He's the 12th one. He's the last one. He's watching. He's in a place of administration and he's involved in this and he didn't have to be. He didn't have to be. So he's a man of motion. He was industrious. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't idle. He was able. <laughs> I've heard people say, well, you couldn't do anything else, so you might as well go into ministry. Oh, brother. Let me tell you, and it's not just because I'm a preacher. Um, even when I was in college studying for ministry, I heard professors say this. Listen, if that's your mentality, please don't ever go into full-time occupational ministry. Don't do it. Because God doesn't need the leftovers of this world. People are like, well, I couldn't do anything else, because so I decided to be a preacher. No. That's not the case here. Elijah, Elisha, excuse me, was involved in a husbandry. He was a farmer. He was out there plowing. He could do it. He he could he could grab those oxen and he could he could command them and he could plant and he was in the middle of that. He was in the middle of administrating that and there was other things he could do. And, and I think we have to understand that God does not call lazy men to ministry. God doesn't do that. We have this persona sometimes that that uh, uh, you know. Well, I'm going to work my whole life, and when I have nothing else to do, and I'm just twiddling my thumbs, and I'll go and I'll get into ministry. Don't do that because that's not God's design. It's not God's plan. Elisha was was busy. We see this as well in Acts chapter 13, uh, verses one and two. It says, "Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and." Mane, which it have been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. God calls Saul, who would be referenced as Paul uh, after this passage, and Barnabas into the work of church planning, and they were busy in the church of Antioch. They weren't sitting on their laurels. They were up and at it. They were serving because God calls men who are industrious. So he was a man of motion. He was a man of maturity. He knew who Elisha was. He understood the significance 
of Elisha's invitation. There was a depth to his spiritual understanding. Realize this, being a prophet right now in Israel uh, was, not, was not a cakewalk. It was not some glorious calling, and it was not advantageous. I mean, listen, Israel was known for killing their prophets. So it wasn't like Elisha comes by, Elijah comes by Elisha, throws his mantle on him, and Elisha turns and says, what does this guy want? Like, what? Uh, <laughs> you know, in our uh, inferior forms of communication today, sometimes funny things can happen. Uh, you ever gone to text something and it autocorrects and you send the, the, a hilarious message to someone and they respond back with like, what? They have no idea what you're talking about because the message didn't get across. That's not what happened here. Elisha knew the significance of what Elijah had done. When Elijah cast that mantle onto Elisha, he realized there was something spiritual taking place. He had the depth of maturity to realize that, to identify that, and he understood the significance. By the way, we got to stop here and mention the aspect that the ministry belongs to God. It wasn't Elijah's. He didn't own it. He wasn't out trying to build a name for himself. And Elijah understood that his ministry at some point would come to an end. And God would use another man. In fact, God would use another man twice as much as he used him. And you know, the heartbeat of every preacher should, or every pastor should be this. The guy that follows me, I hope he does double the work that I do. I hope God blesses him even more. You know why? Because we've got to get out of this kingdom building idea that it's only about me. Because it's not. It's not our work. It's God's calling and it's God's work. It's God's sheep. It's God's church. It's God's bride. And we have to realize that the ministry was going well before we ever step foot on this earth. And it will go until the day that Jesus Christ returns. And we ought to celebrate. We ought to celebrate and champion the next generation or the next man that God brings along to do the work in any place, as long as they're called, God called and they're following this book. So we see he was a man of means. He was a man of motion. He was a man of maturity. So we see that in Elisha's call to service. The next thing we see is Elisha's compliant submission. I love what happens in verse 20. Immediately as this takes place, it says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he, this is Elijah speaking, said unto him, Elisha, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Now, the first thing we see is his immediate response. He left his oxen mid-plow. Maybe he was coming to the end of the field and he was turning. Maybe not. Maybe Elijah was walking through the field and he was cutting him off. And there happened to be some moment where Elijah places his mantle on the shoulder of Elisha and Elijah keeps on walking. And Elisha doesn't say, man, are you kidding me? And throw it to the ground and keep doing. He wasn't tunnel vision. He knew the significance of it immediately. He comes to a complete stop and he runs after Elijah. And he doesn't say, hey, buddy, you dropped your mantle. No, he knows exactly what's taking place. And he left his oxen mid-plow. He immediately moved at the calling of God. Friend, I'll tell you what, this is what we need in our lives. I don't care if you're being called to occupational ministry or if God's working on your heart about uh, a specific act of service or a specific kindness or a specific um, area of your life that you need to give over to him. When God calls, we should act. Boy, what blessings we forfeit in our lives because we dilly-dally. What blessings we forfeit in our lives because... In a moment of uh, deliberation, in a moment of fickleness, we do not act decisively and obey God. Not only did, do we see his immediate response, we see his integrity is revealed. Now, Elisha is not giving any excuses here. He runs after him. 
He knows the significance of what has taken place, the spiritual significance of what has taken place. He knows the cost. He's going to walk away from wealth and affluency. He's going to accept an occupation that really was hazardous. And when he, when he runs up to Elijah, he says, let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I will follow thee. Now, sometimes people confuse what Elisha says here with what takes place in chapter Luke, or excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, uh, where, the, where the man comes and says, hey, let me go bury my father, and then I'll come serve you. And Jesus Christ says, hey, let the dead bury the dead. Now, realize this. Uh, what that man was saying was not, hey, my father's died. Let me go put him in the ground. What he was saying was this. Let me go take care of my parents until they die. And then when I've taken care of all that, then I'll come. Because he changes it there. And he says, well, let me just go tell him farewell. And Jesus Christ says in verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is not what is taking place here. Those are These, these are not synonymous. They're not apples to apples. All right. Elisha is not saying, hey, let me go take care of my parents or let me go ask their permission. That's not what he's doing. He's saying, listen, I'm already yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. But I realize I have a duty to at least tell my parents where I'm going and say goodbye to them. And so he fulfills this obligation, this responsibility that he has. A character is demonstrated here, and that's his integrity. He doesn't give an excuse. He's not asking his parents for permission. He was, not, he was honoring his parents by demonstrating his duty to say goodbye. And that's important. It's important. Not only do we see that his, his immediate response, his integrity is revealed, we also see his invitation was real. His invitation was real. This was this calling was not mandatory, nor was it manipulated. And that's exactly what Elijah says. He says, hey, go back again. He says, what have I done to thee? What he was saying is, listen, this is not the calling of Elijah. It is not me, a prophet, who's pressuring you to be to come and be a prophet and to be my assistant. He says, I'm not doing that. This is of God. And we know this is of God because earlier in the chapter, God had said, go do this. So God is working behind the scenes, if you will, spiritually in the heart of Elisha. He feels the pulling of God, which again speaks to his spiritual sensitivity and the maturing of his understanding, uh, the maturity of his understanding. And so we see that this is a calling of God on his life. And Elijah saying, listen, no pressure here, man. He said, it's not of me. I remember, <laughs> I remember I had been here for like here in the mountains for about, I don't know, maybe it was a two or three years. We were having a VBS. And there was a man who was visiting who had brought his kids. And he was in the little hallway down here where we would dismiss the kids into. They were in our fellowship hall and they get dismissed. And he looked at me. He said, well, let me ask you. He said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm the pastor here of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And he says, well, what else do you do? I said, well, um, our church is to the size that it's a full time. It's a full time thing. They take care of my responsibility. They take care of me, and and I uh, and I am engaged in the work of pastoring full time. He goes, well, let me ask you something. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. Because <laughs> whenever anybody says that, you think, oh boy, here we go. And he goes, are you a God called preacher or an educated preacher? And I thought, man, I've never been asked that question. And I looked at him and I said, you know, I'd like to say I'm both. Now. <laughs> We realize this. I think I understand what he's saying. I don't agree with the differentiation between the two, but I understand what he's saying. There are some people who are called to preach and their mama called, their daddy called, they're uh, they're pressured into it. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre's sake, all right? Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So we're not to be uh, constrained into it. We're not to be forced into it. It's not like, well, we ain't got anybody here that's willing to be the preacher. So you know what? You're the guy, man. We think you're the man that's going to do it, and we all want you to do it. And you force some guy into a position that he's not gifted for and not called to. This is a spiritual calling. The invitation to become a prophet for Elisha was real, not because Elijah was the one that cast the mantle, but because God had called him. I also believe, though, that preachers, a call to preach is a call to prepare. And we have enough people out here that deal um, with this book in an erroneous fashion. 
And if you've been called to be a pastor, you've been called to be a student of the word of God. People say, well, but God used uneducated disciples. You're right, but they walked and talked with Christ for three years minimum. And I can tell you this, walking and talking with the greatest Bible teacher that's ever stepped on this earth is equivalent and superior to any doctorate degree that we have today. So those men started unlearned. But by the time they were at Pentecost and were empowered by the Spirit, they were learned of the gospel. They knew what they were talking about. That's why John says, what we're telling you, we've seen, we've tasted, we've handled of the Word of God. They knew what they were talking about. When you think about the Word of God, let's just look at the example of what we have before us. If Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, which is up for debate, but if Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, then he was the greatest penman of the scriptures. And he was a highly educated man. If he did not write the book of Hebrews, then Dr. Luke was, is accredited with writing the majority of scripture as a penman. And he was a doctor, which is highly educated. Nowhere in the scripture do you see that God desires for people to be ignorant. Now, that doesn't mean God can't use someone. Hey, God used Balaam's donkey, and he had no education. So if God can use a donkey, he can use anybody. But if he calls someone in the ministry, he's calling them to give, um, as Paul said there in the book of Timothy, give attendance to reading, exhortation, to doctrine. These are things that men who are called to ministry should know. So we see that this invitation was real. God had called him. Elijah was not manipulating him or coercing him. God came calling and Elisha unequivocally and immediately surrendered. The last thing we see about this passage is Elisha's complete surrender. We see Elisha's call to service, Elisha's compl a compliant submission, and lastly, Elisha's complete surrender. Boy, I love what takes place here. Verse number 21, it says, And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. There's three things here I want you to say. First, his surrender, it was definitive. It was definitive. You know what he did? He went back and he burned his bridges or he burned his boats, as some say that Cortez did. That's up for debate as well. But there have been other men, other men that did the same thing. There was no retreat. There was no possibility. He goes back. He, he slaughters one of his oxen. He burns the implements, the farming implements. He feeds the people. He takes care of them. And then he leaves. He tells his mom and dad goodbye. It was definitive. I was reading this uh, ministry uh, connection thing and this guy got up or got into the thing and wrote this like sort of like a, a post or an article. And he said this, he's like, guys, listen, I want to encourage you to go to secular college and have a plan B for ministry, have a backup plan. And I sat there and I thought, no, listen, if you want a backup plan, then you're not called to ministry. It's all or nothing. Elisha here slaughters the oxen, burns the farming tools, and walks on. Peter and John, or John and James, they left their boats, they left their nets, and after the ascension, they never come back to him. After the empowerment of Pentecost, we never see John or James going back to fishing. They walked on, they forsook all and followed Christ. We have too many people today that want to just kind of halfway sell out for God. No, friend, listen, I have no other plan. This is what God's called me to. If I can't preach and I can't pastor, I'd rather go to heaven. And I am dead serious about that. There is no plan B. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't men that have to make tents on the side, but I want to encourage you to realize this. There's only one time that we know of that Paul made tents, and that was when he was planning the church at Corinth, and he did so for a specific reason. He did not take money from them. He was still being supported by other churches at the time, but it wasn't enough. He did it just to make ends meet. He started it when he had to, and he dropped it when he could. It was not 
He wanted one foot in the ministry and one foot in a secular occupation. He had a plan A and a plan B. That is a unbiblical philosophy. And it's not the philosophy Elisha had. He sold out. He walked away. It was definitive. Not only was it definitive, it was demonstrated publicly. <laughs> you know what everybody knew that day? Everybody knew this. Elisha came in. He killed the oxen, one set of them, burned the farming tools, fed everybody, and said, folks, this is what God's called me to do, and I'm leaving. It was public. We have too many secret saints. <laughs> We have too many people that that uh, aren't willing to publicly proclaim, this is what God's doing in my life, and I'm going to serve him. I am going to be sold out lock, stock, and barrel, and everybody's going to know it. Can I ask you a question? Do the, do the men and women where you work, do they know you're a Christian? Do they know that you have, have you raised the flag and the standard high and said, I serve Jesus Christ and no other? Or are you, are, are you a secret servant of Christ? You know, they say silence is golden unless you're a Christian. And then it's just plain yellow. It's just plain yellow. Don't be that way. Elisha makes it public. He burns his bridges and steps out for Christ, steps out for God. The last thing we see is it was devoid of pride. Look what it says. Then he arose and went after Elijah, get it, and started doing great and wondrous miracles. No. And immediately a double portion of the mantle fell to Elisha. No, it's not what it says. And immediately his fame was spread abroad in Israel. No, it's not what it says. It says, and he ministered unto him. You know what he did? His calling at that moment was to go and to serve Elijah. It was to serve Elijah. It was devoid of pride. He left everything. He publicly proclaim what God had called him to do, to what? To go and to be the assistant, to go and to be a servant to the man of God while he wore the mantle. The mantle was still Elijah's. And he served Elijah until the mantle became his. We have too many men in ministry that are Absalom's. Old preacher once said it this way, and I think it's exactly right. There's only two things that you're called to do. You're either called to pastor or you're called to help someone pastor. Those are the only two options. And it's very fascinating when you look at even this Old Testament dispensation. Elijah was the prophet. And Elisha would become the prophet one day. But as long as Elijah trod this earth, Elisha ministered to him. Same thing with Moses and Joshua. As long as Moses was alive and Moses was the God called leader, Joshua served him. And then came that day where God said, be strong and have a good courage, Joshua. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with thee. There is a transition of authority. There is a transition of leadership. And it was going to come in the life of Elisha, but it hadn't come yet. And so what does, he sur what does he surrender to? He completely surrenders to service. You know what we need? We need, we need more servants today. We need more people that are willing to hold up the arms of Moses, if you will, and watch God work. This is a tremendous passage. If a man is not willing to be a servant for a season, then he's not qualified to be a leader. He's not qualified to be the leader. That's why I truly believe that young men who go into Bible college should spend time as a youth pastor uh, or an assistant pastor, a children's pastor. Sometimes they're outreach pastors, but they're these roles we have in the local church that are for the purpose of grooming and mentoring and serving so that then they can learn and earn their stripes of ministry so that then they can step out and God can use them when the time is right. And I, I truly believe that. I believe that's mentoring. You see it with Paul and Timothy. You see it with Paul and Silas. You see it with Paul and Titus. And I think that we have to reduplicate that today. And we see that in the life of Elisha. What a tremendous blessing that was. Tremendous passage. God's still calling people. It's not that God's not calling. Sadly, it's that men are not hearing. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our study here in the book of 1 Kings. 
And we look forward to being with you again on Sunday. Let me reiterate that if you weren't here in the beginning of the broadcast. With the weather, what they're predicting right now for our weather on Sunday, it looks like we will not be able to have a service. I'm about 98% sure that we will not be able to. It does no good for you to drive here, sit in the parking lot, and have to keep your windows open, uh, rolled up. They're calling for a quarter inch of rain or half an inch of rain just in the morning. And uh, and so it's going to be a deluge. And what we'll just we'll just broadcast like we've been doing. So that's the plan. I will put out an official word on Friday. As we get closer, because we all know meteorologists are fallible, right? And so uh, they have clay feet and they hardly ever get it right. So I'll put that official word out uh, Friday. We'll put it on the website. We'll put it on email with uh, Pastor Dan. If Pastor Dan does not have your email address, please contact us and give that to us so we can get you in the loop on our email um, communications. Well, God bless you. Let's end with a word of prayer. And then I hope you have a good evening or a good rest of the week. Father, we love you. We pray that you use your word in our hearts. Father, that you would protect us during this time. Lord, that you would help our hearts to be stayed on thee. And Father, I pray that you will help us uh, to be uh, heralds of the gospel during this time. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. God bless you.